Therefore, if we have to build these partnerships, we have to be able to absorb the tensions that are inherent in working with dissimilar others. The tensions which are inherent in working with those who don't use a cognitive, conceptual, theoretical approach to understanding problems, but who speak about the problems in an intuitive, emotive, musical, artistic manner. They can describe the richness of the problem, but they can't describe it in three big concepts. We have to use the concepts in a way that they can help in understanding the causes underlying dynamics of those problems, but not concepts in a way which undermine or negate the intuitive, emotive and artistic expression within which resides seeds of knowledge. It is this challenge which is a practical challenge of colleagues within the institution of higher education that we need to find a way to address. We believe that it is possible, we believe that it is desirable, we believe that it is the only way forward. It is here that institutional leadership, leadership of colleagues like Dr. Jayanis, Dr. Sharifa, Dr. Saran and many others like you, that institutional leadership is critical. It is a leadership which is inclusive and which is bridging. It looks at your own institution but includes in that those who are surrounding it. The social contract with institutions of higher education that Dr. Sharifa talked about can only be seen if you have a bridging leadership. If you are only busy looking inside your institution, you will never see the aspirations surrounding your institution. We have to therefore nurture such bridging leadership in our institutions of higher education. Just as we nurture such bridging leadership in our community leaders, in our industry leaders as well. I am certain that such leadership exists. I have seen it around the world. But I think we need to encourage that, promote that, nurture that in ways that we may not have done so far. There is a significant requirement also that Dr. Jan speak eloquently about influencing policy makers in our countries, in our regions. You would be quite amazed at the kind of support that several countries and regional bodies provide to this kind of community engagement effort that I was surprised to know. Coming from South Asian context where very little policy support till recently had existed for this, I was surprised to learn that European Union has been for the last 10, 11 years supporting the growth and expansion of what has come to be known as science shop movement in Europe. Science shops came about through the leadership of chemical engineers, physicists, water scientists, biologists who wanted to make their science somehow relevant to addressing the problems of their neighborhoods where their research labs were located. Science shop became knowledge intermediaries. They were the interface between communities and research institutions, universities, labs, etc. The problems that science shops addressed were the problems that community leaders, civil society groups, local mayors brought and said, look, we don't know what's going on. Can you help us address this problem? The solution that emerged was not the only scientific solution recommended by the researchers. They were asked to produce more than one possibility. Because what may be the best solution may not necessarily be the most acceptable solution. What may be best from the eyes of a scientist may actually be not so best 
in the eyes of the citizen. This created a space where science could interact with citizens in a way that actual practical problems of water, of pollution, of transport, of traffic, of noise, of livelihood would be addressed in small communities. The science shop movement in Europe is quite different from the way university community engagement has taken place in other parts of the world, precisely because it is the natural sciences which are at the forefront of that engagement. And I would like to appeal to you to consider that going forward in our region, certainly, university community engagement should be holistic in the, inside the university. It is quite natural and often that students of social sciences, social work, etc., go out in the field, even sometimes students of primary health care, nursing, etc., and relate to the communities. But it is not so common that chemists, biologists, metallurgical engineers, physicists, etc., also view their work just as those who teach literature that there is a link between what knowledge they are teaching, discovering, rediscovering, is also knowledge that is relevant for community engagement. In that sense, holistic, institution-wide engagement has to be nurtured and not merely in so-called social or humanities parts of the university world. I raise this question because moving forward, the biggest issue of social responsibility of universities and higher education institutions is not going to be just about how they teach young students and what they learn after they finish. That pressure is already on. That's not the pressure of the future. What knowledge is being taught? What skills are students learning? Do they have a role in society? Are they only serving their own self-interest and vocational and professional interest? Or are they also behaving as good citizens? Those are the questions that are already being asked. Going forward, in the next 10, 20 years, the questions that will be asked are going to be questions about what kind of knowledge, what kind of science, with what ethical and moral underpinnings we produce that science and knowledge. Don't forget the entire genome project. Don't forget the projects that took place in Manhattan in 1940s, which resulted in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were scientific, knowledge-producing initiatives, but they somehow lost track of ethical and moral underpinnings. Increasingly, ordinary citizens, citizens who have never been to universities or institutions of higher education, are going to ask that question. That will be the question about social accountability, not merely social responsibility. Social accountability, how does your research, how does your knowledge production contribute to at least the principle of do no harm, if not do some good? And that question is increasingly on our table. Research councils are increasingly asking that of research proposals. Ethical questions are on the table and I think they will become increasingly important. It is therefore in our interest to work with our new scholars, to work with our new researchers and to help them understand that the science and knowledge that they are producing is contextual in the way human history is evolving, in the societies in which they live, and not merely isolated in the small labs, antiseptic as they may look like. I do want to also take this occasion to mention to you how honored I feel that this is the first time in public I am speaking about the forthcoming UNESCO Chair on Community-Based Research and Social Accountability of Higher Education. 
as Dr. Sharifa mentioned, as has been mentioned in my introduction, Dr. Bud Hall at University of Victoria in Canada. And I attended the conference, the second higher education conference at UNESCO in July 2009. And we realized that a lot of people present there were working on these issues. But UNESCO's own declaration somehow did not capture this part of the work. If at all it was captured, it was seen as the third mission or something you do after you finish your main business. Maybe before you go to sleep, have a cup of tea. Kind of thing. But you have had your sumptuous dinner and dessert and all that, and possibly in some parts of the world a glass of wine too. But that's not the way we are looking at engagement. That's not the way we are looking at relationship between institutions of higher education and the communities that surround them, communities around the world. We are looking at it in a more integrated, more organic and holistic manner. So we work with the UNESCO colleagues there and we work with GUNI and other networks present there, African Association of Universities present there, to include in the announcement, in the declaration of UNESCO after 2009, two significant principles. One was valuing, respecting, encouraging, nurturing indigenous knowledge. And two, creating mutually respectful partnerships between communities and institutions of higher education. Mutually respectful, not necessarily equal, not necessarily identical, but just mutually respectful. 